Thank you all for coming. Um, it's been really great to be here at the conference and to hear some really common themes in the presentations. I know this morning I heard um, Stephen Duckett and Lorimer Mosley and, and two keen things that came out of their presentations was education and the importance of education. And I'm particularly um, very passionate about educating all the people we work with. So I know in the room we've got a mixture of you know case managers, injury management professionals, um, employer reps, etc., policy makers. But the more we can educate the people that we're working with and the people that we're all here to help, the, the, the better I think our outcomes will be. So it was great to hear those themes come out of the two speakers this morning as well. So this title, I actually think it's a really cool title. I, I'm glad you came and hopefully you think the same. Um, but it's really about you know, how, how can we harness the power of beliefs and perceptions, which are such personal things to us all, um, to optimise work and life participation. And so the presentation kind of takes the focus of thinking about how can we in our roles do that, but how do we more importantly support individuals to do that themselves? And so I'm going to take you through some of the evidence around why this is such an important thing for us at IPAR and the Work Health Group. And then Louise is going to talk through um, how IPAR have taken this program, which I was instrumental in developing, Positive, and which is very much focused on beliefs and perceptions, and how IPAR has um, utilised that with people that are referred to us for support. Okay, so obviously I'm going to start with defining um, what, what is she talking about, about beliefs and perceptions. We all sort of think, oh yeah, beliefs and perceptions make, sort of make sense. Um, but I'll sort of just go through and get you to understand sort of what I actually mean by that and what, what, how we interpret that. And then I want to talk through some relevant literature. So you can see it's just not Dorothy Frost's view of the world, but there's actually some really um, compelling evidence about why we need to think about beliefs and perceptions, which I don't know about you guys, but in my career in injury management, OHS, not really something we talk about normally, is it? <laughs> um, and then um, Louise will take you through um, going through Positivum, which is our assessment and health coaching program, which we developed in conjunction with Monash University and several other experts in um, the field of injury management and recovery. And then importantly for today's conference, Louise is going to take you through some results from IPARS, what we call our Comcare, a Comcare sort of stream of business, which is um, obviously people that have been referred to us that work for a federal government agency or some of the licensees under the Act and then go through learnings and next steps. So we'll leave a few minutes for questions, probably five or so minutes. We also have, um, IPA has a big booth downstairs, so feel free to come and see us at the lunch break as well. Okay, so what are beliefs? Um, we all have our own beliefs. Um, you, sometimes I think it's just things you sort of take for granted that you believe in certain things. A really common one is your, um, spiritual or religious beliefs, you know, the kind of things that haven't always got um, evidence or facts behind them, but they're things that we all know that we believe in and we really hold on to quite firmly um, and are quite a big part of, of us and our, our being, I suppose. Oh, what's going on with the Did slides? Yesterday. Did it? Okay. <laughs> so it's not me? Okay. Um, I really need to read the slides, so hopefully. <laughs> It stops flashing. Um, the interesting thing about beliefs, so in the context of this talk, is they're things you really hold on to quite firmly, and they're actually quite hard to change. So, um, as as a you know case manager or a rehab consultant or an injury manager, it's important to understand that different people are coming, um, are working with us, and we're interacting with them, and they have their own set of beliefs. But it's also important to understand that you can't necessarily change them. Okay, so it's just good to understand what people's beliefs are because they can, um, they will determine how they behave and maybe some of their thoughts on things. Particularly, um, and I'm going to say this because my background is Greek, but there is actually um, evidence in the literature that people from you know European backgrounds do tend to suffer and complain of a lot more pain and dysfunction from you know back injuries. You know how you always joke and say, oh, they're Greeks, they have a lot more pain. The literature actually says that's true. So, and that's a real cultural thing, isn't it? That, you know, that's, that's the kind of things important to know about, but um, you're probably not going to be able to do too much about them. Perceptions, however, are a little bit different because you actually can, um, people can change their own perceptions. 
and we in our work that we do, we can actually um, tap into the ability that perceptions are quite fluid and support people to change their perceptions. Um, we perceive things through a number of ways, things we see, things we hear, things we smell, memories, things that have happened to us in the past. So different people will, will the same event will happen to two different people, yet their reactions will be very different. And a classic one in injury management, again, is you know two people, um, same injury or same illness, and, and just how they can respond quite differently. One can be like, no, oh, I've had a couple of days off and I'm back at work. The other ones can't go back to work until I'm fully healed and fully better. Okay, so that's a really common scenario you hear a lot, and that's really because of people's perceptions. So, um, but as I said, the important thing is perceptions are not necessarily real. They're not the truth. It's just how that person perceives things and they can change. I love that little cut, that little, um, that little image. A lot of people go, what the hell is, what is it? But it's that, this is a lovely example of a little tabby cat or ginger tabby who um, is feeling quite confident and perceives themselves as something a lot stronger. And that's kind of where we want to be. You could also show it in the reverse where you have a tiger, a lion feeling like a little cat, but we actually want to get um, that scenario. So um, if I go back to um, um, now the evidence, so I'm going to start with um, Dr. Albert Ellis and his, um, oh, there's so much, there's a lot of um, literature about him. He um, was really one of the founders of cognitive behavioural therapy, so really one of the very imminent people in um, the world of psychiatry and psychotherapy. Um, he's not with us anymore, but he did live, live till his 90s, I think. So he was, um, yeah, there's some lovely photos of him on, on the intranet. And this is the ABC model, which is really quite simplistic. Um, and it kind of really provides a really nice description of what I'm talking about, about the perceptions. So he talks about A being the event. So in our situation, in personal injury, I suppose an accident or an injury occurs. Um, the person interprets what's happened, like I said, based on um, their beliefs and perceptions and how they respond, their action is C. So like I said before, um, you can actually get a different outcome, which may be back at work, back to full health, and it's not, not really that relevant what actually happened, it's the person's response and their beliefs and perceptions. So that's um, uh, B. Now in Positiven, which is our health coaching model that we've developed and we utilise within IPAR, we actually take people through this. This, this um, we don't have Dr Ellis's photo or anything in there, but that ABC model is actually described in a bit more detail because it's all about we really believe that if we empower the individuals and educate them, they will be able to actually make better decisions. So it's really quite powerful. And as I said, those themes really came out this morning, particularly with um, Lorimer's presentation. Um, Sir Mansell Elwood, a lot of you have probably hopefully seen him present. I'm not sure if he was at the Comcare conference last time or before. Um, and I think he's actually coming to the life insurance conference in next month, Lou, which you're Great. going to. Yeah. So he's from um, Wales. And um, this is just one little quote, which I like, but he's, again, published widely on this whole theme of the psychosocial factors and beliefs and perceptions. Um, and, and really just that first point that the barrier in getting a job or getting back to work is primarily psychological, social, personal and cultural, not medical. So he's actually saying those factors are the main reason. They're primarily um, the reason. And that personal attitudes and beliefs actually dominate sickness and incapacity, not the medical problem, not the diagnosis. I'm assuming this is all not new to you guys, but um, I just thought it was important to give the evidence base for what we're talking about. Um, Dr. Waddell, he actually um, passed only just last year, which is really quite sad. Again, really um, very prominent in this field. We use his um, Oh, the um, assessment, it's the, I always get the um, acronym wrong, FABQ, Fear Avoidance Beliefs Questionnaire, and it really pulls out what people's beliefs and perceptions are. So we use that in the positive assessment and we talk to our, um, the workers that come to us for support about that to get them to start thinking, oh, hang on, maybe I am thinking about things in a, a bit negatively or maybe I am actually um, looking at things the wrong way. It's not an easy discussion to have, but it's, you know, it's really important. And the fact that um, Dr Woodell has produced this assessment that helps us to do that, which is highly you know, validated, et cetera, um, is really is fantastic. 
So again, he's saying the symptoms, limited correlation to um, capacity for work. It's pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> when you think of where, you know, general public's and doctors' views really are on, in regards to, you know, like um, Lorimer was just talking about, you know, quickly get an MRI, get scans, you've got to really know what's going yeah. on. How important really is that? And Kim Burton, again, the three of these men have published widely together as well. And um, Dr. Burton, his background's actually a little bit different. So um, um, Mansell Alman's a doctor, Gordon Waddell, orthopaedic surgeon, real interest in pain. Kim Burton, you know, has worked a lot with them and in this area, but his background's more in ergonomics, so a slightly different take. Um, and he again, again, talks about there's a lot of evidence in general, um, with how fit you are for work and whether you go back to work is actually not really about your condition or your illness. It's very much about um, all these other psychosocial factors, including your beliefs about your condition and your pain, your family situation, your satisfaction and attitude to work. So I'm now going to um, hand over to Louise, who's going to talk about Positivum, which um, we developed, as I said, with Monash University and some other expert consult consultants. And it was very much about focusing on beliefs and perceptions, which we think is really quite unique. So thanks. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, there have been some amazing presentations I think given at the conference so far, and I wanted to take a leaf out of Blythe Rowe's book, um, saying yesterday that you know sometimes we can talk and provide facts and evidence about things and policies, um, but it's actually storytelling that gets people on board. So um, a couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. It was a couple of months after my wedding, so just <laughs> the ultimate come down back to work. Um, interestingly, I was came back to work, my role was made redundant, I got a new job, and then boom, you've got cancer. And um, my perspective on the cancer was, all right, this is happening and we've got to deal with it and there's some medical advice that we've been given around surgery, radiation and chemo. Um, but that takes up this much time. I have this much time left, I want to go to work during that period. My workplace, on the other hand, were really nervous about that. And my mum couldn't believe I wanted to go to work. And I found myself in this really odd position where um, my beliefs and perceptions were just around moving forward, staying active, distracting myself from what was going on by doing the thing that I love. And the first thing you should know about me is I'm a psychologist and I love psychology, so you can't take that away from me. Um, and, you know, what ended up happening was that I did work all the way through it and it was wonderful and if I hadn't, I do think I would have got really caught up in the pain and the sickness model of what was going on for me. And I know that as a fact because when I was about 21, um, I was in the Army Reserves and I broke my wrist, which meant that I didn't have to go to work for six weeks. And I remember when the six weeks were up, I was super depressed about it. So it's good for me to work. And I think, you know, we know the health benefits of work, it's good for everyone to work. And we're all going to take our own kind of approach to it. Um, but the question becomes, if we know that beliefs and perceptions are really key to how someone goes on to kind of commit to and gain benefit from their rehabilitation and treatment, how do we find out what those beliefs and perceptions are? Because if I just said to you, um, you know, well, what are your beliefs around pain? It would be really hard for you to come up with the words around that. But when um, Professor Lorimer was speaking in that last um, plenary session, and he said, well, you know, most of us think that pain is a signal something's wrong in our body, and, you know, he sang that great song about it. Um, I was like, okay, right, that is my belief around pain. But now that you're re-educating me and telling me it's not necessarily the case and that actually it's, you know, something that kind of helps us to avoid potential future injury, I can reintegrate that into my system. And so that is what the Positive and Program is about. First, we seek to understand through doing this assessment, and I prefer to call it a questionnaire because when you get clients coming to you in a... Um, 
workplace injury setting, they've already been assessed so many times, and usually those assessments link to um, whether or not they're going to receive compensation or treatment or whatever. And this is actually just about getting to know them and understand them better. And so we do that with a um, standardised assessment that we worked on with the great people at Monash University. And so what we've done is taken, or Dorothy, what Dorothy has done, um, is taken some validated measures that we know give us good information around health, well-being, coping strategies, pain management, confidence, things like that, and then paired it with a new 15-item questionnaire that tells us more about people's beliefs and perceptions. So the beliefs and perceptions are about how do I consider my injury in the context of my ability to work? How do I think other people perceive me based on my injury? And that's a pretty key one because we know that the employer's response to the injury actually has a big impact as well on the trajectory in terms of returning to work. So if I go to my employer and I say, you know, I've had this um, incident occur and I'm injured as a result of it and my employer kind of pushes away from that, no, it can't be our fault, you must have done something wrong, then my return to work is greatly impacted by that. And we, you know, we want to do a lot of preventative and, and promotional work around helping employers to understand how to respond. But in the meantime, it's really important for us to know if that's affecting the individual, because then that becomes a really important point of intervention for us. Um, so the, the person comes into our offices, they're meeting with their consultant, and the consultant you know, talks to them about what's happened for them, and then introduces them to this concept of us understanding them um, via a questionnaire. The questionnaire is completed online, takes about, ooh, takes about 10 to 15 minutes to complete, so it's not um, in any way onerous and the results come up automatically. They come up in the form of a bar graph. Oh, I thought that was my next graphic, I apologise. They come up in the form of a bar graph across a number of different domains like coping skills, pain management, work beliefs, health beliefs, things like that. And that lets us show to the person in a kind of a graphic, demonstrable way, you've got some real strengths in these areas and we're gonna use those to your advantage, but here are some things that it looks like you're struggling with. So you're very low on health beliefs, and we know that, that what health beliefs means to us is your confidence in your ability to recover and return to work as a result of this injury. So tell me more about what that means to you. Is there anything that's affecting your confidence in that? What do you think are going to be those barriers? We know that that's problematic. So immediately, this gives the consultant the ability to really centralise their thoughts around where am I going to target my time with this person? Because our time is not unlimited. And it also gives us the opportunity to really educate that person themselves. Sometimes we you know, um, have a resistance to something and we're not 100% sure why we have that resistance to it. So it helps the person understand, well, you know what, maybe it's coming from here. Based on those results and the conversation that we have with them, we move into health coaching. And as Dorothy said, um, health coaching is, has its basis in cognitive behaviour therapy. So for me as a psychologist, coming from, you know, a real treatment background, I see this as the ultimate complement to treatment because where the treater might be dealing with the pain and they might have their own psychologist talking to them about certain things in regards to the injury, what our cognitive behavioural approach is looking at is the other things that are forming barriers later, like, you know, I don't like my treater or actually I've been in that job for 10 years and I'm enjoying this break. I don't really want to go back. Those kind of secondary gains that we can sometimes get from our time off work. Or indeed, just reintegrating the notion that we may be potentially forever changed by our injury. So how do I now perceive myself in my work context? Because a lot of us, me in particular, see ourselves very much as, um, 
you know, what we do, you know, it takes up a third of our life. So we kind of want to be, you know, at least a little bit aligned to that thing that we do for work. So um, our consultants are trained health coaches, which is pretty exciting. And that allows us to give um, a really structured approach to what the person is in terms of what we're teaching them. We already know that our consultants are good at rehab, but if you go and see a consultant, indeed like a psychologist or whomever, and you come out feeling better, um, that's only the first step in the process. If you want to be empowered, you have to know how they made you feel better. You know, we don't, we don't want magic to be what helps people recover from conditions. We want them to know the good health behaviours, the not so helpful health behaviours, and all of the things in between that are unique to them about their recovery. So, where have we used this? Um, quite extensively, we've got nearly 4,000 people have completed our positivum assessment since it was launched, and a significant proportion of those actually come from the work that we do in Comcare, so 20% of those, most of which comes out of the ACT, you know, Victoria and New South Wales, but we do have a reasonable spread um, nationwide, as you can see there. Now, this is the bar graph that is shown to the individual to help them understand what's going on for them. So as you can see, um, this is a bar graph where the person has initial results compared against um, their post-health coaching results. And I guess the blue bar is the initial assessment and the green bar is the post-assessment. And for this individual, you can see that um, they've actually... Oh, sorry. This is actually our overall data for um, a number of cases. So across 50 ComCare cases where they've completed the health coaching and they've completed um, the pre and post assessment, this is what the, the data looks like. But an individual would see something exactly like this for themselves. So what we know is that um, so far the biggest impact that we're having is on people's coping skills. We get a 30% improvement in people's um, perceived ability to use and understand skills that will help them. And, you know, given that we're working with adults, that's actually really pretty cool because we think that, you know, you might want to assume, it might be your core belief, that people generally have the skills and, and coping skills that they need already but actually they're learning from this program. We know that they get improvements in um, their self-confidence, and in particular what's really important is those health beliefs. They start to, when they gain more control and understand the skills that they have, they start to become more confident in that ability to return to work. And that's what we really need from them in order to engage with the rest of their treatment. Um, so across ComCare, what we know based on um, the data that we have is that for 60% of our files, when we used Positivum, um, we received an increase in capacity. For 34%, they remained the same, but they, they didn't deteriorate. Um, and for 6%, we had a decrease in capacity, but when looking into those, some of the reasons were things like the person then went on to have an operation, which meant they experienced a setback. So we can't control everything that happens, but you know, to know that we have the capacity to do something for at least 60% of people by using this program is actually pretty special. Um, so Positivum itself has evolved. Um, you know, first of all, we kind of came out with the assessment and the health coaching, um, you know, worked to validate all of that with international, you know, using international research and our partners at um, Monash. Um, and then we worked with the behavioural insights team and they applied what's called like nudge theory. Has anyone read the book Nudge? It's fantastic. You should buy it. Um, I didn't write it, obviously. I would be, wouldn't, I would be here, but... I wouldn't be working. Um, anyway, moving forward, <laughs> really good. What it, what it talks about is, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one we know how to influence people. How do we influence the greater amount of people? So we applied that in the book as well so that we catch the most people with what we're doing. Then we thought, you know, there are actually particular, um, 
I guess, injuries or illnesses that we might be able to target more specifically with this product. So we worked with the Cancer Council and Swiss RE to develop a particular product around people who are going through cancer. And we also worked with Phoenix and Dr. Peter Cotton to develop one for people who are going through the experience of trauma. Both of those things being quite unique. And we ensured that, again, in delivering this, our consultants were trauma-informed and trained by the Cancer Council in order to do that work and best understand people. So wrapping up, because I want there to be a little bit of time for questions. This is fantastic, okay? <laughs> no word of a lie. It's based in research. It gives pre and post results. We've seen those results make changes for individuals and groups. Um, and we're, we, it's been so successful that we're now launching um, an electronic online version one October. So that's it from me. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>